What's up everybody, this is Xander the DMV Poet and I'd like to welcome you to the first installment of Streams of Consciousness. We have here with us Anna Temple Ava. Hi. Of what we're going to be able to do and accomplish in the future. Okay. Yeah, we really do. Like, uh, exactly. Like, I mean, it's so funny because, like, when I think of college, like, it's just like so long ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember. Okay. I almost forgot. I almost forgot. I almost forgot. But we're going to talk about a couple of things that Ana's working on today. Um, she's an amazing spoken word artist. I actually met her going to Anne Arundel Community College, um, working with uh, Miss Carlisa Finney. <laughs> whoop, whoop, shout out to Carlisa. You know, and working with the Poetry and Lyric Performance Club, which was also called the PLPC. And we just kind of performed at the school, we ran around Baltimore, and just, you know, ripped and ran. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, I don't know, do you have any, were you going to perform any pieces today? Um, yeah, I'm always prepared. Okay, because I know Julius, my, my nice little program manager, he mentioned to me that he wanted me to actually perform some of my pieces on today's show, so this is the first installment. And I thought it would only be right for me to perform something from our PLPC. Dang. Yeah. You know, something that's just like that old and that, you know, gritty, like 19, 20 year old black kid in Anne Arundel County. <laughs> you know, I got something to talk about. I cannot even remember. <laughs> yeah. that oh my God. You're such a beast for doing it. Oh, please, please, please. But um, we're going to turn the music down a little bit and I'm going to start this piece. Um, just to give a little bit of background on it, it's called See Me. And the main reason why I wanted to use this piece as an introduction, especially as the DMV poet, introducing myself to all of you that may have clicked this link and that are listening. Um, as an artist, I am very socially driven. I'm very concentrated on what's happening in the world today, what's happening in the streets, what's happening with our children, what's happening in the schools. Like, I'm just very interested in current events and current emotions like things that people are constantly going through and with everything that's going on with the our rap music the atmosphere of our music industry hip-hop i really wanted to use this piece to kind of demonstrate to everybody out there making music that everything you do impacts everybody else if you're on a very large platform and a very large stage and millions of people are watching you everything you do they're going to judge me for that if you look like me. So if you rap about mollies and if you're talking about slipping drugs into a girl's drink and taking advantage of them and you're talking about just all types of whatever you want to talk about, everything you're doing reflects the perception people have of me as a young black man. So I'm going to start. <laughs> like, um, as I walk down the street, they see me, but... But they don't really see me. They look me in the eye and describe what a nigga be. They memorize my, my medium brown complexion, my, my slim build, and my baggy jeans. So if a crime gets committed, they'll be able to finger me. I got a job interview, but, but no opportunities in this life being colored. There are no guarantees. In this life being my color, there are no guarantees. I go to school, but my teachers are too intimidated to teach. But bet I walk down the street. The police have put holes in me. Bet I cruise down the street in a black whip with a black glass roof. It'll be a black officer to racially profile me. So, so with all this on my mind, I, I get high on a daily with a Dutch master of knowledge. I'm rolling blunts with these facts they refuse to teach in college. That's, that's weed with no seeds, but milestones in history, things that are untaught, unheard, and what's virtually unseen. Like how in 1863, it was a man of God that taught I was a beast. That Jesus Christ put me in those fields on a daily just to rot. And for, for 500 years, African-Americans, this is what we were taught. 
I was raped in my heritage. I don't know who I'm supposed to be, so I, I, I work hard and I hustle hard, all for a country that whores me. So I go to school and I, I pay taxes. I go to work, all for a country that whores me. So, so as I walk down the street, you see me, but you don't really see me. You look me in the eye and describe what a nigga be. You, you memorize my, my medium brown complexion, my, my slim build and baggy jeans. So if a crime just so happens to be committed, you'll be able to think of me. And that's basically it. Are oh, we snapping? Yeah, oh, we're not thank snapping. you guys. That's so, not cool. That's so cliche. We we're not snap. about stereotypes on this strains of not, consciousness. Uh, what is it called? Love Jones? Uh, yeah, you know, this is 2013, not 94. But I was definitely <laughs> snapping. So. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Temple. Only from you. <laughs> Only from you. But yeah, I mean, that piece kind of brings me back to that, that militant, that rebel, that kid that was just like, I'm going to be great regardless what you think of me. You know? I remember that kid. Yeah, yeah. Short hair. Used to wear fades back in the day. Yeah. I don't remember your fades. You don't remember the fades? Oh, yeah, I'd rock a fade back in college. But let's talk about you. Okay. Now, I know my story of how I started spoken word. But what's up with you? Like, how did you get started? What was, like, your first memory in terms of for poetry? My first memory as far as poetry. Mm. Um... My first, first memory as far as poetry was, you know, growing up, being like in like middle school, elementary school, mm-hmm. and I was always bigger, taller, I always stood out, mm-hmm. so I would get like kicked on, or I wasn't the most popular kid, so my teachers would always encourage me to write, and so I started, I would write little short stories about like, there's one story about a, um, I don't know why I remember this, but there's one story about an ant, who like was like, like this little run ant and like nobody liked them and then they like wound up being like the queen ant and everybody <laughs> thought she was so beautiful so like I would do stuff like that yeah um and then as I got more emotional in the middle in middle school as people who have middle schoolers know that's mm-hmm. kind of when like their emotions like start to explode yeah um you know I started needing an actual outlet and um I was encouraged to buy a teacher to like, you know, write write how I felt down. And so I started writing stuff down and it just started to come out like rhyming and like as prose. Yeah. So I'm, you know, writing my book and scribbling my book and then um I'm an like as far as art is concerned, I started off as an actress yeah. in a the theater. So, um, but when I went to Anne Arundel Community College, I wanted to get involved, and there was this new group that was, that everybody was trying to start, and um, I got involved with them, and that was the Poetry and Lyric Performance Club, PLPC. Yeah. Which is, oh my gosh, it was great. So we, you know, went and did the, the groundwork, and had little events, not even little, like huge <laughs> events, and um, poetry, and we became like the cultural backbone of the college mm-hmm. um they're like oh well we want to put some uh i just got strawberries oh somebody's <laughs> excited <laughs> so excited um sorry um no so we we you know they needed to throw a little bit of diversity mm-hmm. into an event we became plpc was the people that they called so you know i started to write because we would meet and talk about business and our events and stuff and then we would just write yeah. we would just talk about I think poetry. that was the best part of it yeah so that's kind of where I, like that's not where I started but that's where I just started to become more of myself as a poet yeah I mean, I think performance poet, rather. Yeah, I think as a that's the one of the biggest things I think you just made clear, just being a performance poet. Because I mean, when I was younger and before I came to Anne Arundel, before I even <laughs> met the PLPC or anything, like it was just like I was a poet, and I didn't understand what it was to be a performance poet. And it took a while for me to get that. And I think it was just being around everybody else. I think it was just being around a bunch of other artists, a bunch of other creative minds and that are able to just put together ideas and give us topics and give us keywords and do the writing exercises we used to do. And it was that was just always inspiring. And what I liked about it was it was safe. Like, yes. Um, if I were to call somebody now um, and say, I've got a poem that I want to... I just wrote and I want you to hear it. 
and somebody that's on the scene, depending on how well I know them or whatever, I might hear that exact same poem mm-hmm. <laughs> or something very similar on stage. So, it, like, you know, the, it was so organic and there was so much... It was just like real. Like yeah. I remember us saying, "I don't feel like it's finished," or "I'm confused," or like there was a it was a safe space to kind of critique and grow and learn, mm. and you didn't have to worry about all of the BS. Yeah, you didn't have to worry about somebody judging you. You didn't have to worry about somebody taking your your ideas. You didn't have to worry about that. You you didn't really have to worry about people hating on you. I didn't. I, I don't even remember experiencing that. I felt we all respected each other as artists, as young artists, and we tried to help each other grow as much as possible and it was a space where everybody was protected and everybody was appreciated and I don't as an adult (laughs) I don't necessarily feel that whenever I go out to different venues whenever I go out to perform I don't necessarily feel like this is a safe place sometimes I just feel like I'm an outsider and I'm a stranger you know and I think it's just all up to the venue you go to and the people you're around but it's hard to get one of those real good spots yeah I think it's unfortunate because there's a lot of people that are awesome writers and poets and um, they, they're they very talented but they don't want to get on the mic because they're holding a piece of paper or they're not they don't feel like they're part of the right clique or mm-hmm. they're put at the end of the list at the end of the night because they're not a, a certain person or, a recognized or with name. a certain person yeah. or they're the very first person and nobody's there but you know and it's just kind of like it's, it's just unfortunate because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of talent out there. Mm. I personally believe that Baltimore is one of the premier spots. For, uh, I have to agree. For poetry. Of course, next to DC. But, you know, it is. I mean, if you can survive as a spoken word artist in Baltimore, in my opinion, you are going to be a successful spoken word artist. And the main reason why I say that is just the atmosphere of Baltimore, the culture of Baltimore. You know, I mean, what do you think about that? Like, oh, well, bad timing, huh? Like, like, what do you what do you think about what makes Baltimore one of the premier places for spoken word? I don't know. I think it's the Illuminati. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they just shoved, they just shoved everybody to the harbor, huh? <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm sorry, but like, it, oh, like Baltimore. The, the level of talent is so high yeah. that when you get on stage, if you don't bring it 100%, if you don't have your stuff together 100%, then you've lost, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and it's that's a good thing and a bad thing because that means people that are breaking in are kind of like, oh, I'm not going to do it because I'm scared. Yeah. Um, but then the people that do break in are like, well, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to really do it. Yeah. But it's kind of like, like it's the proving ground. Like mm-hmm. there are people from New York, you know, Florida, like people from all over the state that come, and because I'm from Baltimore and I'm so spoiled, they come and I see them and I'm like, what? Like <laughs> that's it? <laughs> you the feature because you from where? <laughs> and and that's not that's not even shade. It's just that because we have people like Tamami. Like Slankston Hughes, shout Slankston out to Slankston Hughes. Hughes. Love the poet. Love the poet, shout out to we Love the poet. We got so many people that are. Femi the drop fish. Femi. Femi. You can't Femi forget about Femi. Femi the drop fish. <laughs> like, we got, like, but the thing is, like, there, like, there, are, it goes on and on. Yeah, it does you know, definitely like, go on. And these are people that are my friends, people yeah. that I know and that I talk to. And because you have all of that, the standard is so high. Mm-hmm. So if you get on stage, you feel like you have to be somewhat. There. Yeah. Um, so I think that's what it is. It's like you just don't have any choice to suck when you're around people <laughs> that are so amazing. I mean, I, one thing I do love about the atmosphere and the culture of Baltimore is it's so organic. And I think if you're from Baltimore, you know you're from Baltimore. You know who you are. You knew who your mother was. You knew who your grandmother was. And usually they were all from Baltimore. And so it's just like you have this deep rooted heritage in the city by itself. And then the city has this very specific um, personality. Mm-hmm. You know, this very specific look. This very specific way of life. You know, a lot of people live down there. Go up there. Up? Yeah, it's up, right? Yeah. You know what? Yeah. Up. Um, yeah, I agree. I think, um, I know personally, my family is from uh, Trinidad and mm-hmm. New York. But um, 
there is that like traceable line you know for most people and again I think it's a positive and a negative because you know people who are on the west side they don't really leave the west side people on the east side don't leave the east side and so like even the fact that you know you know that DC is 45 minutes an hour away like some people are like oh my god another place in time you know like I've got students who don't who've never been Ocean City like so it it's two sided Mm -hmm. Have this richness because everybody knows exactly where they've been and where they're from and what they're doing, but you're also kind of isolated and yeah. closed off as well. Yeah, I mean, one of the I, as an artist, as a you know, as a career poet, um, what is it like? What's the difference between performing in Baltimore and performing in DC? The difference. Well, for me, I think that there's a safety net in Baltimore. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, even though I know poets from um, D.C. and they're awesome and they're always very nice. And shout out to Droopy the Broke Baller. Droopy the Broke Droopy Baller. Droopy the Broke Baller. Um, Pages Madam. I have to shout them out to Joseph Green, uh, Benny Black. You know, the list goes on and on. Yeah. <laughs> My voice just turned into uh, D.M.B. Poet's voice. I was, <laughs> I was shouting all those people out. Because I know them. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I think that, I think it's different. I think, I don't know, it's, again, the Illuminati. The Illuminati. Um, Especially place these people all over Baltimore <laughs> and D.C. Yeah. No, but I think in D.C., um, there's very, there's a very social, um, consciousness. Mm-hmm. Um, and, Yeah. No shade, but I think you guys are just like trying to bring it really hard so you can be like <laughs> Now, I honestly, I honestly think like the DC poet tries to bring it very hard because I mean, we have people like Benny Black that have made it, you know, went to deaf poetry and then came back to the city and actually like cultivated the whole culture when he was at Station Nine. Like, when it's able to create these teams like the Graffiti Slam team, like the Youth Slam team, he's doing as a DMV. Like, he's really able to energize the spoken word market. Like, just U Street. I want to shout out Tumman City Youth uh, Poetry Slam. Oh, team. yes. Just because I, I, I would get in trouble with my dance. And so, I read about woo-woo. the book on Facebook. Yes. Congratulations. Out for them. They're so excited. They got a tour coming out. Yeah, I mean, it's just so important for our artists that make it to a certain level of awareness in the cities to reach out and to pick up these kids. I mean, I know a lot of kids that are on the spoken word scene very heavy right now, and they're very, very successful. They're able to book the features, they're able to work on the music, they're able to translate into other streams of marketing and revenue, and they've all been picked up by somebody that basically paved the way before them. You know, they had somebody to help them out, and you know, as an artist myself, I always wonder, what can we do as artists? to help the up-and-coming artists, to f- help them with their journey and get out there amongst the crowds and amongst the numbers? I think, um, bless, I think <laughs> um, mentoring mm-hmm. them and really kind of just being there, pushing them, knowing what people did for us. Like, yeah. you know, like, not taking the, the excuses, not taking the BS, of uh, reaching out um, and being available. Like, mm-hmm. I don't think, I think I've seen a couple times where people have reached out and they become like little versions <laughs> of whoever they reached out. And that's not cool because you want your own brain, yeah. you know? And, and it happens, like if I'm hanging out with DMV Poet, right? And we're hanging out every day, of course, my mannerisms yeah, might pick up. Are and things are things. So it's not even on purpose, on purpose that these things happen, but you have to kind of be careful. But I think... Um, the important thing is that you do reach out, but you also give enough space for them to craft who mm-hmm. they are. So it's like it's not like, oh well, you went up on stage and your cadence, you know, it was kind of weird, and I didn't really like it, and it didn't make mm-hmm. me feel comfortable. And it's not what I'm used to, mm-hmm. so don't do that. I think you should say, wow, you know, where did you get the cadence from? Yeah, like your that's, cadence that's was different. really weird, and it made me <laughs> listen and why, you know, where did it yeah, come from? Pulled me in. But yeah. um. Yeah, just questioning. I'm gonna when I work with young people, I'm a questioner. Mm-hmm. Like I don't really give a lot of. Uh, well, I'm not gonna say I don't give a lot of direction, but I'm more about questioning and having them think for themselves. Yeah, I mean, I honestly, 
I honestly feel like overall for a child, and you know, that's you know, I say child loosely, you know, is as we get older, you know, the num the age number of a child kind of goes up. <laughs> but, but you know, child in terms of like twelve to eighteen, I, I really feel like there's so much energy and there's so much creativity and there's so much going on in the mind of a child. 14 to 18, like as long as we direct it in the right place, in the right place of creativity, I see so much success in these um, <clears throat> spoken word groups in high schools. Right. Well, I think also that like I like to really be careful about the direction part, mm -hmm. you know, because they're dealing with stuff that like is very adult, mm -hmm. you know, that's very real. And for someone who's older to be like, oh, well, I'm older, so of course you're only, I'm going to tell you that you're only should feel like this. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've seen um, young people get shut down at open mics because um, they've read a poem about how they were in love and it was like the realest love they've ever had. And they're like 14 and people are like, whoa, whoa, that makes me uncomfortable because you're young and I'm, yeah. you know, and so you're not in love and like sh completely shutting them down. Yeah. And that's not right because that means that they're not going to come or they're not going to express themselves. And it's also, safe. it's also very naive because I mean, as an artist, as a writer, what I do is I evoke emotions. What I do is tell stories and I make people feel a certain way about how I'm telling the story or what direction I'm going with it. Like for to me, if a 14 year old feels love and he can write about what he feels, I mean, that's as true and as real as anything I could write at 28 about love. Because what you're doing is you're just articulating how you feel at that moment, whether it's real or not. And I do feel like that does kind of hit a wall a lot of times when you go to open mics around the country, not just around the DMV, just all over. Like, cause you get a very, especially after the uh, Def Jam poetry came out, especially after like, you know, shout out to Sheehan, the prototype and Georgia, me, black ice, lemon, like those artists were able to transcend from the stage to a mainstream media area, to a regular show where people wanted to see what they had to say. But it also kind of projected an image of what a spoken artist, what spoken word artist is. And if you don't sound like that, maybe you're not a spoken word artist. Right. You know, maybe you're not the right kind of poet. Maybe you're not the right kind of performance poet because you don't sound like black ice. You know. But I also think that it's um, kind of like a survival of the fittest as well. Yeah. Um, because, of course, you know, you can't have 10 million <laughs> poets exactly. on the poetry scene. So some people... Are going to drop off. Some people get pregnant, and uh, I want to raise my baby and mm -hmm. screw the poetry scene. And <laughs> <laughs> some people leave, and some people get like real jobs. Who does that? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, like uh, things and perspectives change, and think people leave and move. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also, kind of like as a built-in self-preservation, that some of these things that we see that might be cons you know, or not positive things yeah. are kind of set there so that you can prove that you really want to be here. You yeah. can prove that you really want to do. And I, I, that's very, very important. I feel like it's very, very important for an artist to have the ambition to make a mark, to leave an impression when you perform. And, and I only say that because it's a, it's a driving factor all the way through. Like when you, when somebody approaches you, and they tell you they remember that you performed something at some open mic on some stage on some day when it was raining outside and they always remember it and they wish they could have a copy of it. Like when you get that experience, like it just kind of reminds you why you write. But also as a career poet, you want that person to be able to go to a website or, or something and buy a CD or buy a product or request you as a feature. But yes, that is a very, <laughs> it's very important um, but well, at, but if we're being realistic about career poetry, you know, um, you told me that if I have gotten a check from poetry, that I'm a career poet. Because I was like, poet. I'm not sure I'm a career poet. Like, I got a real job. No, but. I mean, at the end of the day, I have known you for a long time. And if you Google on a temp Temple Abram, you'll see all of the amazing things that she does, all the products that she kind of puts out and stuff like that. I'm and glowing let's talk and about, levitating right now. I let's talk about see. your recorded material. Let's talk about your music. You released the album, didn't you? I did. I did. I released an album uh, a while ago called mm -hmm. Speaker Prayer. And it was just kind of, uh, well, all of my poems are really like kind of like prayers about 
who I am and what I want and um, who, you know, who I want to be. So uh, Speaker Prayer was basically um, the title track of the album. Mm -hmm. And it was about um, how I pray through my poems. And so there's, you know, lots of different other tracks on there. I also have a um, another album that is, has been um, coming out for quite some time. <laughs> um, but another project called Dirty Laundry. And that concept is about just kind of like being naked and airing out your dirty laundry. Like, that's what we do on stage. Mm -hmm. Like, yes. well, not all of us, but... Um, yeah, most of us. Most of us. The better you, ones of if us. You, no. <laughs> Joking. If you That's listen, um, if you listen to closely enough, um, mm -hmm. we're putting a lot of ourselves out there, yeah. and we're doing a lot. Uh, uh, we're doing what we were told not to do. Mm -hmm. You know, that type of private stuff stays at home. Like, I personally, I talk about rape. I talk about you know relationships mm -hmm. and and my self esteem and the things that scare me and experiences that I've had. And so these are things that are supp supposed to be private. Yeah. Um, so the whole idea is putting myself out there um, on Dirty Laundry and uh, airing that out. Mm -hmm. I mean, all right. So what about, all right, I think we did talk about this before. You were going to perform a piece for us. Oh, yeah. So let's do this. Why don't you introduce it? Give us a little bit of background from it, the title, when you wrote it. And everything like that. Okay, well, I'm going to actually um, read a new poem. Oh. I just recently did the 30-30 challenge. Yeah. I did it in eight days. Oh. Because my, um, <laughs> my birthday is in April. So, for those that don't know, the 30-30 is you write a poem a day for yeah. National Poetry Month. And um, so I wrote, so I think around like the 25th, I was like, man, I should do this. Like, I should write the poems. So I wrote 30 poems in eight days. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this poem is one of the poems that came out of that process. Okay. Um, and it's called 530. Okay. So am I... Let's go. Down? Okay. <laughs> it is 5.30 a.m. She has already cried. And that's enough of a testimony. She is dressed in tattered prayers. Grasping the next word of them against her falling chest, she has run out of everything. Except faith. She is tired. Dirty and unwavering, God promised her, so she waits. Holding on for the dawn, she prays. Floating in and out of consciousness, she is a dream. Her life is but a labyrinth of near misses, but now she sleeps on a plastic mattress in an empty room, cradled and warm. Anyone else would credit her warmth to the blow dryer and blanket working in tandem to retain the heat, but she knows better. God is here. God keeps her company shooed away evil taunts about three hours ago. It's just them now. On a plastic mattress, in an empty room, nothing to absorb her cries, her disappointments, her fear, only the fact that she and God are still here. So it could be worse. And she begins to talk. To beg, to scorn, why is she here? Salty and dry like the saltines that were her dinner. What did she do to desert? Warriors get parties when they return from the war. Never before. So she needs to fight. That's what God's here, here for. An oasis in the storm, a reminder of what she fights for. She sits. 5.30 a.m., sitting in the floor, crying and remembering, healing and breaking some more on a plastic mattress. In an empty room, closer to God than she's ever been, she waits for the miracle to come in. Waits for the cavalry, the fanfare to scoop her up. She isn't scared, just remembers those late night conversations when it was just her and God. Remembers the promise she made herself. Remembers the plans for healing and wealth, so she sits in an empty room on a plastic mattress. Mm. It has begun. Okay. That was a very nice piece, Miss Temple. Thank you. Um, I have some questions for you, if you don't mind okay. me asking about the piece. Because there was a couple of things that really, really um, shot out for me. And um, one of the bigger questions is kind of more general about you as an artist. And I think um, hearing that piece from you mm -hmm. kind of made me want to ask it a little bit more. And, one of the, and the question is, um, like, I have a purpose, 
you know, as DMV poet, as Xander, as a writer, like my, I have a purpose and I, and I, I really try to stick to my purpose when I write. What do you feel as a career poet, as somebody that impacts people with your work? What do you feel like your purpose is? I think my purpose is to heal mm -hmm. and to be authentic and to do that in front of people and to give them the um, give them the example that they can do it as well. Mm -hmm. um, I am a healer. I do work in the healing industry. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been a healer. Uh, so heal me, mm -hmm. someone else. My mom, my brother, my yeah. dad, my boyfriend, like heal. <laughs> like that's my purpose. Um, I think that a lot of my poems are very, very heavy and they are all about me mm -hmm. and they are all a part of my story. And I think when people see me cracking jokes and being funny and mm -hmm. making faces and being all crazy and temple-y, um, and then they hear my poem, I feel like that contrast is enough of a testimony, you know, like yeah. it's enough of a testimony to be like, wow, she really went through that and she's still standing here and she's okay. Mm -hmm. And I can do that too, you know, and I might be going through something similar, but it's okay because I can see the end of it. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Okay. Now that piece, um, I kept hearing reference to the plastic mattress. Did that symbolize something special, or was it more of a direct reference? It was a direct reference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, actually, I've just recently started telling a story. I think um, when I get writer's block or when I'm afraid of something, I mm. remind myself to just tell the story. Mm. So I say, just tell the story. I'll just tell, say that to myself. Okay. And so um, I uh, moved away in 2008 to Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Um, in preparation to move to Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. And in, I was supposed to be there for like two months before I went and traveled and gallivanted across the globe. <laughs> and um, the whole, like the stock market crash, like everything, like the whole financial structure of America crashed while I was there. And long story short, I wound up um, and I, I was homeless for a minute, couch surfing and things in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And um, I uh, wound up in a girl's apartment. She had an apartment, and she had an extra room, but mm -hmm. she couldn't afford to turn on the heat um, because you got to pay heat and electricity is different. Mm -hmm. So you got to pay. She couldn't afford to turn on the heat, but she had the electricity. And um, somebody gave me a mattress, a plastic air mattress, and um, a space heater that broke. So then I got a, a hair dryer mm -hmm. <laughs> and I made a little temple taco <laughs> and um, kept myself warm like that. But that was, I'm just getting to the point where I'm processing and being able to talk about it and being able to like say, okay, this is the story. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's the mattress. Okay. The damn mattress. I mean, <laughs> I mean, one thing, I know we've been through a lot together mm -hmm. and one of the things that we went to together was the Disney college program. Oh yeah. Yes, Praise we did. We did go through that. Yeah, the rats. <laughs> you know, the pixie dust. I mean, it's like, I mean, me as an artist, everything I go through impacts how I write and what I write. Um, I know you did that amazing Peace Corps program. And like in terms of like our experience in Florida, because I remember when we were in Florida, we really didn't have anything. All we had is what Disney gave us, a couch, bed, carpet. You know, that was it. Not a lot of money, not a lot of food. You know, we were on the struggle most of the time. But, you know, it kind of it, it inspired me to write this whole different kind of struggle poetry. Like, it was just like, you know, not necessarily struggling about food or struggling about, you know, getting to work. It was more so struggling because I didn't have the emotional support that I was used to. It was more so struggling because I was trying to make a long distance relationship work. It was more so struggling because all I really had was a cousin in Orlando. And, and most, me. Yeah, you know, I had you and I had um, Shaldu, Waikita, Renfro and Ebony and, you know, all those amazing people. But it's just like when you're used to living with your family, when you're used to having your mother and your father there, if you need $20, you can get $20. And now you're in a place where everybody around you is just as broke as you are. 
you know, and it's funny because I had another a piece from that era, from that Orlando, Florida. I want to get so good at you, like keeping old poems. Let like, me I'm tell just, you, so I don't. Let me tell you, I had to get organized I'm on so the Avery. <laughs> let me tell you how everything used to look like, and I know everybody can't <laughs> see it. But everything used to look like this. This is what everything used to look but like. But that's it. That's a struggle. Like that's like napkins and <laughs> napkins. Back of I have some candy envelopes in here. And yeah, envelopes. all that stuff. I mean, my whole thing has always been the best stuff I've ever written is the stuff I lost or I forgot. So it's like I always have to make an extra effort to keep things. Like even if it's a really, really small, insignificant thing, I want to keep it because you, I never know when I see one line here and another line over here, and then I have a whole half a poem right here. And if I put them all together, oh my God, it's the total story. Who knew? You know. But this one particular piece, it's that I'm going to recite for everybody. It's kind of called "The More I Talk to You," and I just kind of get I did it in a in a mindset of. Um, you know, when you first meet somebody, you know, I had a period of my life where I was always first meeting somebody, you know, it was just always, you know, oh, hey, what's your name? You know, I and, remembering the after a while. <laughs> you know, so did I. That's why I've been with the same one for a <laughs> long time, because, you know, going through that, that first initial experience, like when you meet that person, boy, girl, dog, and they're just interesting and they're just intriguing and they just make you smile and you don't know why they make you smile. And they just do those little things that make you feel good about yourself. And you don't even know why, you know, what they're doing to make you feel that way. And all right, so I'm just going to, it's called The More I Talk to You. And this is something that I did right when I was in Orlando, Florida, running around with my little cousin, Sean, and just acting as crazy as I wanted to. But um, the more I talk to you, the more I realize how much of a stranger you're becoming. <laughs> but in a good way. The more I talk to you, the, the more I realize the potential for me to love you is far more than I could ever imagine. The more I talk to you, the more I realize the true woman you are. Not just physically, but, but mentally. The more I talk to you, the, the more I want to make you smile all the fucking time. The more I want you to be happy just because you're with me. Just because with me, you feel safe. You feel secure. You feel like I'll make you happy forever. The more I talk to you, the more I realize how smart, goofy, corny, and beautiful you really are. The more I talk to you, the more attracted I am to you. The more I fantasize through work and school and play how, how really, really soon we'll connect. One of these days, I'm going to knock on your door and you won't even know I'm coming. Once you come to the door, I'll slowly undress you and I'll slowly, centrally make love to you. Make love to you till our bodies force us to let go. Till we can't do this anymore the more I talk to you the more I want you the more I talk to you the more I want to talk to you and that's the end and you know it's I always felt that that first couple of weeks first couple of months of exploration of another human being is one of the most phenomenal things it's like one of the most phenomenal feelings I like when I'm on the toilet and I can call my babe and be like babe <laughs> What do you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite part of the relationship. That's your favorite part of the relationship. When the door open, I need, I need some toilet paper. Bring man. my charger. <laughs> Where my charger at? <laughs> That's my favorite part. I mean, part. you know, that's a beautiful part. You know, it's you know, just to give a little background on me, like I've like been in a relationship for five years now, and I've never been able to say that, like especially <laughs> that long. Like I've never had somebody that stuck it out with me that long. And it's just real, really beautiful thing. This is the point where you can open up the bathroom door. You say, babe, bring me my charger. I need some toilet paper. Any paper towels out there? You know, bring my cigarettes. You know, you could say that. And there's no problems. And it's just like, but just that first, that first couple of months when you can't say that stuff, when you can't fart in front of them. And, you know, when you can't, when you're just on your best behavior and you think they're the most amazing person in the world. That's like my favorite part of the relationship. I'm not. I'm never that person. I'm like, my part stinks. <laughs> Nine. Like I don't do it, but I'm like I need you to know. Yeah, I need you to know. This, this is what honest I look moment. like. Truth this moment. How I feel. <laughs> Truth moment. I'm an asshole sometimes. <laughs> please, please love all of it. Yeah, I mean, especially you know, I always feel like relationships and spoken word walk hand in hand because I mean, to me, spoken word is just people articulating emotions verbally. 
in poetry is just people writing down the emotions and it's just like that connection of a relationship and of being in love or having your heart broken or even if you like you know five years strong there's gonna be bad situations there's gonna be obstacles there's you gonna get be, old body yeah i mean it, it happens i mean it happens and it's just always a question of whether you can build and work on and correct and move on and the biggest thing is moving on a lot of times you can correct you can build you can apologize you can buy expensive gifts but if somebody can't move on from what happened they'll never be able to get back to a good place with you and i think the biggest thing is just moving on and poetry always helps me move on in every aspect of my life. For me, um, like poetry and love and stuff was more like a fa- was more kind of like a fantasy for me, um, like a way to like craft because I definitely believe in the power of your words. Yeah. So it was more of a way to craft that perfect person because for the last well two years ago. Um, as of two years ago, I'm not celibate, but I was celibate for about four. I remember when you were celibate. I was, yeah, everybody remembers us. Yeah. <laughs> so I was so angry and stressed all the time. Four years on purpose. I did it on purpose. It's so crazy. Um, but but that's when I kind of started to craft the man that I wanted to come to me in poems. I've done that. I've crafted the person I wanted to be with. Yes. And so, <laughs> yeah. I'm, that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, I've not been celibate for two years. So I'm okay. Off, off of that. Okay. But. <laughs> Let's just say I knew Anna a Temple before she was celibate. And I knew Temple after she was celibate. I don't. I do see the difference. And I don't have a preference, honestly. I think they're both fun as hell. <laughs> I do have a preference. <laughs> I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. But listen, we got a couple of minutes left. Um, did you have a piece that you wanted to share with us one more? Um, sure. Yes. Okay, I love it. So since we got the like sex and music, mm. like, nah, let me talk about love. So um, I uh, I normally get in trouble about writing poems about people that I'm with because some of you, you know. I do too. And I try All the and time. I. I I've tried very hard. Like, I'm very um, private. But sometimes you just gotta write it out. Yeah. And, you know, you write it, and whoever I'm with is like, they think that every poem is about them. Is about them. It's of not. Course. Boo, it's not. I'm of sorry. Course. But, um, yeah, so I wrote a poem, and I don't care if he's mad. I'm going to read it. Mm, it fuck is, him, let's go. I, oh, I'm gonna say that. <laughs> <laughs> um,. Yeah, so, uh, but this is about, um, about him, so. Black men sit leaned back in swivel chairs thinking, solving being who God crafted them to be pillars, saviors, statues, quiet, brown, filled with contention, they hatch plans to begun, become gods and kings. They sit in thrones in front of glowing screens making 3 minutes and 23 seconds spin into more than space on different waves, wavelengths. They make magic. They make magic too. Chop, screw, scratch, mix frustration and duty. They are they bear down and push their women's expectations into fruition. They give birth to. If they are up to it. If they love enough, they sit and shred the day's limitations. They transcend in a tank in ball shorts, beer in hand, black and sane. They relax and contract. At the same time, they take time to be beautiful. I love you, baby. Wow, I felt love from that piece. <laughs> I always love. I one of the one of my favorite things about the spoken world word world is I. And I'm not trying to be racist. I'm not trying to put anybody out there, but. I love seeing a black woman on stage celebrating a black man because I you don't I don't get to see that in my regular life too much and I don't get to see it on TV ever. But seeing a black woman genuinely celebrate a black man is a beautiful thing. It is. I think we need more of it. Yeah, we do. But I think that can pretty much wraps up our show today. Um, We're probably going to be able to do a continuation interview later. But this is pretty much it for the first installment of Streams of Consciousness. Can I shout out my uh, 
website. You can shout out everybody. So please go to www.7thenumber/temples.com. Um, that is my company. There's a whole bunch of stuff we did not get to talk about. Please go and check it out. Follow me on Twitter. It's Anna A N A underscore Temple T E M P L E. And on Facebook, it is Anna Temple Rodney. Please holla at me, find me, Facebook me, friend me, tweet, throw me up, scratch it, rub it down, all of that. And that's it. Have a great night.